Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And then especially now it's Bulan Puasa and started second day. I hope you're coping well. And I have here with me my ex-colleague, Roshan Gunalan. Dr. Roshan was uh, actually gave us a talk when I first started my webinar. And I was right. really, really impressed with the content of his talk. Um, I think I've shared it on YouTube. If not, I will look for it and share it. It was really um quite um how you see uh how you he put a lot of things in a very different perspective, uh something that could make everyone understand and look at the uh, orthopedic in a different way. I was very impressed actually, uh, but of course I didn't invite him again because um. Because I got busy, I got a lot of speakers. <laughs> and also because there was a friction between me and SJMC at one point of time. And uh, of course, we have gotten over that. All right. Gotten over that. So um, another fact that I would like to say is uh, Roshan is actually a uh, Punch Gunalan's son. Okay. And uh, I hope uh, you know who is Punch Gunalan. So tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Roshan. Uh, well, thank you for having me again, Dr. Betty. It's quite a quite quite fun doing the webinar the first time. I can't really remember what topic I spoke I on. I can't remember, I, but I can just remember it was so impressive. I have a memory of it. a goldfish on cannabis. Anyway, okay. so uh, uh, yeah, but anyway, thanks for having me. Uh, currently, I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Subang Medical. I deal a fair bit of pediatric orthopedics, so that generally means children with limb issues or gait problems or, you know, limping uh, deformities, etc. But I also do uh, currently do general orthopedic and trauma as well. I've uh, been doing this for many years now. I've been in Subang for four years. Uh, previously, I was a lecturer in University of Malaya for about nine years there. Uh, so, yeah. How do you train for pediatric orthopedic? Yeah, so I was training in the university itself, in University of Malaya, mm -hmm. and I did a one-year fellowship in the UK as well for for pediatric in, in general, pediatric orthopedics specifically. So this is basically after your master's in general orthopedic and all your... Um, yeah, so you do a master's in orthopedics and then uh, you get into a fellowship program or training. Currently, the system is slightly different. If you're with the Ministry of Health, you have the KKM fellowship program. Uh, which is a four-year program on its own, but the universities do it slightly differently. So if in university or ministry of education, the sub-speciality training is slightly different. Uh, and um, currently, yeah. When you, everyone. sorry, uh, when yeah. you actually do the four years, it's on top of the four years of master's in orthopedics. Yes, correct, correct. Yeah. So you do master's, is like your general postgraduate degree, and then you do a sub-speciality, which is another four years. And then uh, there's a certain period where you're bonded to the government as well beyond that. Uh, wow. so it's, a long, it's a long haul if you do some speciality training actually in Malaysia. That's a long what? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let without further ado, we do your um your talk. Sure, no wrong. Uh, start, okay, skip. share your slides. Okay. Uh, so can everyone see this? Uh, not yet. No worries. Okay, great. All right. Okay. Okay. okay so uh, again, thank you, Dr. Betty, for having me. I'm Dr. Roshan, again, consultant orthopedic surgeon and deal with pediatric orthopedics, uh, limb lengthening, reconstructive surgery and trauma from Subang Medical. Okay. Um, wait a minute. Doesn't seem to work. Okay. So uh, we're just going to do an overview. This is generally what the talk will be about. Uh, we go a little bit about the past and um, a brief introduction into what club food is, the definition, the types, the reason why people get it, and uh, something's wrong with my slides. So... No worry. Yeah. Take your time. Okay, so we're back here. The past, the introduction, definition types, reason, the management uh, options, the complexities that may arise uh, when treating club food. And the recap. Okay, so I don't know. I can't change to the next one. Um. Hold on, wait, uh, yeah. I try. Okay, go on. It seems to be going on one slide only. 
<laughs> Sometimes this tech this tech thing uh, forever got glitch. Okay, let's <laughs> go again. All right, so we've passed this. We are back to the same page. I hope the next one comes. Ah, okay. Okay. So we go to the past. Okay. So this is uh the origin of orthopedic surgery per se. Uh, I'm quite sure nobody's read this book. Uh, if anyone in the audience has, congratulations. Is it, <laughs> is it in Latin? <laughs> it's not even in English. So <laughs> generally, the, the, the orthopedic was, uh, you know, the orthopedics per se as a as, uh, speciality was described back in the 1741 by this guy called Professor Nicholas Andre. So orthopedic stands for autos and pedios, which is two words. Autos means straight uh, and pedios is child. Oh, and I see. Pedios together means orthopedics. So that's generally what the meaning is. So orthopedic in itself is already talking about children. So yeah, that's where it started from in 1740. Okay. It started off as a branch of general surgery. And in what it means is it's a specialty concerned with preservation and restoration of the musculoskeletal system. So that's a very, how you say, technical way of answering. Like if you're sitting for exams. Uh, just put the logo there. This is actually a standard logo for orthopedics over the years, probably from 1741. Uh, the concept is where they tie a stick to a tree and the tree will grow straight. Yeah, fairly simple concept. So I'm not sure whether in 1741 they used to tie sticks to children and hope they grow straight, lah, but uh, I <laughs> doubt it. But then again, uh, this is the concept in the treatment uh, of orthopedics. And I put this here because the treatment of club foot does have uh, a component of this sort of concept. So later we'll, we'll revisit that in the treatment part. Yeah? Okay. So what is a, this is an intro. The foot is actually a unique part of the musculoskeletal system. Uh, it has many functions, not many people know. Okay, Firstly, obviously, it supports the body, but it also absorbs uh, forces from the ground when you move, when you walk, when you run. And it provides a lever, a rigid lever for gait. So it's a very, it has to be sturdy. At the same time, it has to be mobile and functional. So the foot is a sort of a complex part of the body, to be honest. Yeah, and when you treat, Co uh, foot deformities in children or foot conditions in children, you need to uh, appreciate a few concepts. And one of it is their physiological variance. So at certain ages, uh, there may be certain kind of uh, positions or deformities which uh, you have to actually know about if you're going to treat them. And there's always a natural history because children are growing, they're dynamic. So the position of the foot will change, the shape of the foot will change. Uh, the alignment of the foot changes as they grow. So you have to understand how that uh, the natural history would be before you try to treat them. Yeah. Uh, and again, whatever treatment chosen uh, should not actually, de you know, deter the growth or, or make it difficult, uh, affect the growth or development of the of the foot itself. And any treatment uh, for any foot deformities in a child always aim to preserve uh, motion. Yeah. So there has to be a mobile foot. Okay, so physiological variance. These Sorry, are can we go back to the previous slide where you say when you treat the child, you must preserve motion. So the yeah. during yeah. the treatment in itself, the child should be should be able to move as normal. No, not really. So the aim of the end result of your treatment should be to oh, regain the end result, not just not it's during not the treatment. The treatment. Yeah. Okay, fine. So depending on the condition, mm -hmm. if whatever you do ends up with a very stiff or rigid. Unflexible yes, foot, then that's not a good treatment. Yeah. The end result has to preserve motion, not the not throughout the treatment. Yeah. Yeah, I understand the end result. Okay, okay. so physiological variations can happen. So sometimes you have these words: flexible metatarsus adductus, which is something like this: the foot facing inwards. It's a, it, these are physiological uh, conditions, which means uh, they self-correct. Yeah. They're not uh, pathological in any way. There's positional calcaneal valgus, flexible flat foot, and a thing called positional club foot, which we'll come back to later. But you do have others which are congenital and developmental abnormalities. So this includes uh, the club foot, which we'll be talking about. Uh, this is flat foot. Okay, and this is a congenital vertical tail. So the obviously extremely deformed foot and nothing physiological about this. So these are variants of foot deformities in children. Yeah, I mean, we haven't come into club foot yet. These are other conditions, yeah? I see. So you have to understand each one that as they are. Okay, so what is club foot? Yeah? Uh, strangely enough, uh, whoever coined the term actually thought that the foot looks like a golf club. 
So yeah, pretty genius, but uh, I guess it does look something like that. But that's how the name Club Food actually came about. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, really. No, the, the, the actual word is congenital telepus equinovirus, which is a long word. So they call it Club Food. I think in Malay, it's called Kaki Clubbing. I don't know, maybe. Anyway. <laughs> So, oh, that's what I used to be. <laughs> yeah, I did put your picture there. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so this is a this is a, actually a picture in the Louvre Museum in in Paris. Yeah, it's called the boy with the club foot. It's actually real. I didn't make it up. And if you notice, his feet actually does have a deformity in it. So I don't know why the picture is there, but it's there in the Louvre. If anyone happens to be there, you're more than happy to try and look for it. Uh, just to know that it, it, it's there. So Clubfoot has been around for many, many years. So this painting was in 1642, by the way. All right, so what is it? What is Clubfoot? If anyone on the street asks you, oh, hey, what is Clubfoot? This is your answer. It's a complex congenital contractual malalignment of the bones and joints. Okay, so basically it's a deformity of the foot and ankle in children. Okay, it's a congenital deformity, right? And the child is born with a foot looking like the picture on the left untreated, they end up walking like the picture on the right. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be both feet. No, it doesn't. It, it can happen in uh, in uh, unilateral feet as well. I see. Yeah. All the 50% are actually bilateral. 50% of the cases. Okay. So here we are. Anyway, how, did, how common is it? The incidence of 1.5 per 1,000 live births, fairly common to be honest. Uh, boys affected more than girls almost twice as often. Bilateral involvement, yeah, 50%. Yeah? And the recurrence rate is a lot higher in first degree relatives. So clubhood is actually inherited with the dominant gene. Uh, a lot of studies still going on regarding this uh, inheritance pattern of clubfoot. But if you look at this happy family here, you notice that uh, they do not just look alike, but their feet are all alike as well. Oh, even the father married a woman with clubfoot. Strangely enough, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then their kids both have club feet, actually. And uh, yeah, anyway, <laughs> obviously, it is not my hobby. But, but it does have a very strong uh, family inheritance, yeah. Especially among twins. In, in Malaysia, you, sometimes you get twins, you get four, you know, uh, two kids with the same condition. Okay. So, how do you diagnose this? So, if anyone has, you know, any experience in orthopedics, or medical is generally like, you know, your inspection, palpation, and all that. So in, in orthopedics, it's usually look, feel, and move, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the three things you do when you do a physical examination. So the same thing goes, uh, how do you diagnose club foot? First you look, then you feel, and then you move. Yeah, right? the second okay. photo is slightly not appropriate, but go yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the concept. Right. So anyway, this picture here is actually... Uh, just shows you the different parts of the foot. Okay, so the forefoot is beyond the tarsal bones, the midfoot is the tarsal lesion, and the hind foot is the posterior part. Okay, the reason I put this here is because the deformities in a club foot occur in every part of the foot. Okay, you have a problem in the forefoot, you have a problem in the midfoot, and you have a problem in the hind foot. Okay, so this is what the clinical fixtures look like. You have an equinus at the hind foot, it's pointing downwards. You have an inversion in the midfoot or the subtalar joint area, so it's pointing inward. You have a cavus, which is sort of a forefoot over hind foot deformity, which means the forefoot and hind foot looks like a cave. And you have an adductus where it's pointing forward. Okay, so these are the generally the four deformities that you get in a club foot. The thing is, they all have to be present together. If you have only one of these deformities, it is not a club foot. You cannot diagnose it as a club foot. All of them have to be present at the same time. Okay, so it's a three-dimensional deformity and it should not be passively correctable, which means after inspection, the palpation part, you try to correct the foot into a better position. If it doesn't, uh, if it's rigid, it's stuck, it's tight, then it's considered a club foot. Okay, so to diagnose it, uh, generally it has to have all these features and it should not be passively correctable. All right, and uh, if you want to classify a lot of classification uh, in, in orthopedics, go on. But the simplest way is to say it's either a postural club foot or a pathological. So the postural is generally a physiological or positional due to basically baby being in a tight uterus, the position of the foot is like a club foot. They come out looking like a club foot, but there's no abnormalities within the foot itself, within the joint, within the bones. So they tend to self-correct as the child grows. 
But the pathological type is where we have a problem. You have the commoner one, which is the idiopathic tract. And then you have a secondary type where the patient has underlying conditions, syndromic children, or those with a neurogenic problem there. Yeah? So for those who prefer, uh, you know, sort of a graph picture, so clubfoot divided into two, physiological, which is the flexible type, or pathological. And the pathological one, you can divide it into two, the common idiopathic type or the secondary type. Yeah? So simple classification in, in, in clubfoot, really. It's the simplest way to, to remember them if, if you want to. So this is an example of neurogenic club foot due to a myelomeningeal seal. They tend to develop, because they have less sensation, they tend to develop ulcers and sores and all in the leg. So make it a little bit more difficult to treat. These are syndromic babies and children with club foot. They're associated with things like atrogryphosis, uh, prune belly syndrome, Larsen syndrome. So these are extremely rare. Uh, but if you do have a patient with this, the treatment... Sorry, do you mind changing slide, please? Uh, which one? Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay. The reason is because when you you show um um what you call it, they will block me for nudity. Yeah. For yeah, that as well. Facebook, yeah. Yes, Facebook will block me for nudity. I so I will get restricted okay. again. Okay. Uh, no, only after this, only got naked feet. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah, naked feet. Never mind. <laughs> okay. So why does it happen? It's generally the pathogenesis of it. So. Uh, how does this happen? You have two. The, the etiology is thought to be genetic plus environmental. Okay, so the classification uh, uh, is generally there are a lot of theories as to how club foot happens. Some say it's due to in utero molding. There's some problem with the muscle. There's some germ defect, which is a bone deformity in its own. Some say it's a vascular lesion. Some say intrauterine infection. What is this? Intrauterine infections. Uh, so there are various different theories, but in general, if you have so many theories, uh, you know, hypotheses why this happens, actually, we don't know why it happens. Okay, so it's probably a combination of all of these, these uh, sort of, uh, you know, studies that have been done. So we don't know the actual reason for it, which is why the commonest is known as idiopathic club food. Okay, so no real uh, cause. But on this it. genetic factor... Yeah, genetic does play a part. Yeah, it yeah. does play a part. But it's so not... There must be a, a, a development problem, right? Fair enough. Development problem, yes, but you have a sporadic, you know, one person in the whole family having club foot yeah. as well. So it's not, you know, suddenly there's no strong genetic component to it as well. So okay. it's a combination of both most of the time. Yeah. Okay. So actually, we don't know why it happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So treatment wise, back in the old days, there were several options. One is the kites method, which was a manipulation of the of the foot and casting. Uh, there were surgical options. A lot of surgery was done where they do releases of the tight muscles and the tight ligaments and the tight bones uh, to correct the position. And the people from France, the French always do things differently. So they have a strapping method. They used to strap the leg every day, exercise the leg, and then put it on another kind of strap and all that. And the French keep doing that even until today anyway. Probably because oh, they're French. I see. <laughs> anyway. Okay. I understand when you say the French. Okay. <laughs> uh, so now uh, what we do here or what we do in, in a fair number of countries is a tried, a tested and proven sort of a treatment plan. Yeah. So this one um, is described by this Wally here, Ignacio Ponsetti. So uh, this is pretty much a well-developed treatment plan. Okay. Because it takes into consideration the function and anatomy of the foot and the response of young tissue, connective tissue and bone to any mechanical stimuli from the outside. So what he realized is basically, if you stretch the ligaments or bones and maintain that stretch, they actually become a bit more loose and supple. So any ligament connective tissue, if you keep it at stretch for a little while, it lengthens. It becomes a bit longer, a bit looser basically. So he's using this concept to correct the deformity. I hope that came across clearly, I hope so anyway. But this yeah. stretch, uh, oh, sorry, I just want to say this stretch, uh, what you call it, concept, right? Mm -hmm. I think it works and it, it, it works even for adults, not so much to change the def uh, deformity or what, but it mm -hmm. works for, you know, for us who are training when we do right. yoga. Uh, no, this is different because when you have a club foot, every uh, deformity is rigid. There's no movement in the foot. It is stuck in a position like that. I so, see. yeah, but of course, strapping, uh, the strapping methods used by the French is different from what we do, the K-tape strapping and all for sports now. Uh, that one actually... No, what I'm trying to say is stretching. 
Ah, stretches yeah. yeah they have to do so, stretches and this one okay uh, we'll go on. let me i just uh, a thought of uh, stretching yeah. okay, go on all right okay so anyway the concept used by ponsetti basically is that if you apply a certain force to the tissue in a certain direction and maintain that force the ligaments the tendons whatever they are they tend to extend they tend to expand a little bit or become more stretchy so the deformity corrects gradually yeah, I'll show you pictures later to show how that works. And Ponsetti is a uh, Italian. Yeah, yeah, I think he's Italian, but he was he got famous in the U.S. in Iowa. Nobody oh. knew him in Italy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Oh, early in his career in Iowa, okay. <laughs> he saw the outcomes. Uh, so what he was not happy about is the previous treatment for club foot using the kites method surgery. Patients at the end of the day develop a very stiff foot. So as I mentioned earlier in the talk. One of the aims of the treatment is at the end of the treatment, you need a supple or flexible foot. Whereas the olden time treatments for club foot actually didn't provide that. Yeah. So he developed a new uh, treatment plan using this concept of the, that he developed, using the concept of, you know, when you stretch the ligaments, they become expandable, stretchy. Yeah, right? Initially, obviously, people were not happy with it. There was some opposition over many years as to whether this was a useful method. However, currently it's adopted by many doctors worldwide uh, using this uh, same method of treatment, except probably in France. Now. Anyway, so uh, efficacy of manipulation and casting uh, is, is, okay, so is pretty much the same thing. It's attributed to the viscoelastic behavior of the ligaments and tendons. So there's this uh, biomechanical properties of these ligaments that contribute to the treatment. So this is very similar to the tree where you put a stick on it. You know, so when you put the stick there, it slowly grows into that. So now we put a cast and the, the leg sort of stretches back into that. So the concept is very similar from 1741 described long, long time ago. Yeah. Right. So the uh, the, the original Ponsetti uh, treatment method, of course, has evolved over time. A lot of people have modified the steps and included a few modifications to it. Lah. But that's generally to suit um, the fact that every patient may be a little bit different. And every, say, facility may be different, so you may not be able to follow 100%, you know, his original teachings. Okay, so this guy, Matthew Dobbs, right, uh, currently works in the Pali Orthopedic and Spine Institute, worked very closely with Ponsetti in Iowa, and he continued to improve the methods uh, described by Ponsetti. There's a lot of research into the genetics and generally in, in, in club foot, and he works to actually promote and educate the concept of this type of treatment worldwide. So Matthew Dobbs was pretty much, uh, you know, Ponsetti's second in command, golden goose, golden egg, whatever. Uh, he was he was his second. So met him a few times. I was quite fortunate too. Uh, Sim sleeping, and I'm standing there. And we did actually have several workshops together as well. Because like, he comes, uh, he comes quite often to Malaysia, and we meet oh. up during the Asia Pacific uh, uh, meetings and all that. So a lot of workshops we've done together uh, with Matthew Dobbs. Okay, so the Ponsetti method, we're back to that. What it really is, it's a weekly serial casting until the deformity is corrected. So you apply a cast to the child and every week you gradually correct the deformity. Once you reach an adequate position, the patient goes on what they call a foot abduction orthosis or brace. Okay, so just to recap, when you have a club foot, the flow is basically casting for a few weeks. Every week you have to change the cast followed by using a special sort of a orthosis, boots and bar, and finally there's a cure, yeah? So how do we do this Ponsetti method, really? So the first, uh, first, first thing you do is, obviously this is a patient with club foot, and the first cast involves unlocking uh, basic uh, Basically, the first, uh, the first cast is slightly different. You actually have to bring the forefoot position into the hind foot. So this is different from what was previously described. That's what makes the Ponsetti method different from the previous uh, uh, kites method and whatnot. Yeah. So you correct it as far as you can, put a cast. Next week, the patient comes, you rotate it following the angle of uh, this arrow here. So you're rotating the foot uh, a little bit more, apply a cast again. And then at the subsequent week, you notice that you can actually rotate it even further. So the deformity week by week is actually gradually correcting itself, yeah? And every week you apply this cast. Once they reach uh, adequate position, most of the time nowadays we do what is called a tenotomy, and this corrects the final part of the deformity, which is the equinus where the ankle is pointing too far down. So after the, the tenotomy where you actually 
um, how you say, you actually cut off a little bit of the the, the tendon part, the Achilles tendon, uh, they get a, a good dorsiflexion. Yeah, I'll come back to that a little bit later, but this is generally the concept of Ponsetti's treatment. Casting for several weeks, and the last procedure is a minor procedure. I do it in the clinic, which is just uh, releasing the Achilles tendon posteriorly so that you get a dorsiflexion. After that, you put them back on a cast for another three weeks. Okay, so what is the concept? All the plaster casts have to be above knee, and obviously, you have to be careful how you apply it because children cannot really complain if they're in pain or if you put it too tight mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, the parents have to monitor the pieces. Parents have to monitor the uh, circulation and all. Uh, usually, it's placed with the knee at 90 degrees and it's changed every week, like five to seven days usually. We do it weekly, which is a lot easier. So, club food treatment follows something like this. After four to six weeks, you can notice that the deformity is gradually getting better uh, with each cast. Yeah? Wow. Okay, uh, can you, wait, sorry. Are these cast um, cream? No, no, we have to mold it onto the child. You, we have you to apply mold it, it huh? Yeah, we have to apply it on the child and mold the feet into a correct position, onto the corrected position. And then the next week, you grow a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and a little bit more until five, six weeks. Wow, it really takes a lot of effort on yeah, the so, orthopedic yeah. surgeon himself because he needs to mold it every three to five weeks. But the, the no, mold every week. itself. You mold it every week, yeah. So every week, you change the cast. And uh, it will rotate. The, basically, it gets a little loose every week, so the correction is easier. But you have to follow, follow certain, you know, procedures and and methods to it. Like it's not as simple as simply applying a cast. Yeah, that's and right. Pushing. That's right. Yeah. So not, there's a concept and a way of doing it. And yeah. how old you start at birth? Yeah. So the 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 best time to start is as soon as possible. Okay. Um, the thing is over here, sometimes patients go, you know, confinement leave, this and that. So sometimes we take get them a little later. But it's always recommended the earlier you start, the more predictable the result and the faster, the better the correction, really. Yeah. Very impressive. Okay, go on. So once they've done this casting uh, procedure, which is a serial casting every week, then they go to bracing. So bracing is using a special type of shoe or boot and bar shoe. And this prevents relapse because clubfoot has a very, very strange, uh, unfortunate, uh, how you say, condition where it tends to relapse or recur. So you've corrected everything every week, all the hard work done. The parents don't wear the brace and they come back with the foot again rotated inwards. It just rotates in again by itself. So it has this very strange uh, you know, concept. If you don't maintain the correction using a special brace, they tend to recur. Okay, and this is where most of the treatment fails because this part of the treatment is basically uh, the responsibility of the parents. You know, that they have to make sure that the child uses the brace based on the, you know, the prescribed protocol and the time and when, when not. So if they miss that or they're a bit lax or the child cries and they take it off, which commonly happens, then there's a problem. Yeah, so compliance becomes a problem with bracing. And that's where a lot of times the, the treatment ends up failing. Okay, so these are some of the braces that we have. Uh, usually it's uh, like uh, like a abducted, like kangkang, like that. Like, huh? So this is the original, one of the earlier type of shoes, the Dennis Brown shoe. Um, in this day and age, this doesn't look very nice. This kind of looks like what the Annabelle doll wears. So currently we have more modern looking uh, shoes. Like, yeah, they have new type of bars, the Do Do Dobbs bar, Ponsetti's bar, Dennis Brown bars. And they have newer type of shoes. Uh, the one on the top right is generally what I quite commonly use nowadays. Oh, the so shoe they look a little better. To yeah. this uh, bar. Yeah, so the shoe has to be connected to the bar. And the child has to wear it like, like these guys over here. Oh. Yeah. Right. So it has to maintain the foot in that position. I think, I think I'll go back to this with the baby. Okay. So they have to be maintained in this type of position. So the child is never happy wearing something like this. So the common problem is after all the casting is done, they have to use this bar until the age of four to five years old. Of course, based on protocol, based on how many hours a day and all that, it reduces over the years. Uh, so the problem when they initially start them on this is the child starts crying a lot. None of the children love this thing. Yeah. So once the child starts crying, it, it follows the same concept. Lah. Child starts crying, you know, uh, mother gets uh, upset, scolds the father, then father says, take it off, like, I don't want anymore. And then they, you know, they don't this, they don't follow the protocol basically. So they need to, you know, be a bit compliant. You have to stress it to them, especially during the bracing period. That is very, very important 
to maintain this on because otherwise the treatment starts again from casting again from day one and it gets very messy as they're older and bigger and all whatnot. But they start walking at, let's say, 12 months to 16. Yeah, so they, 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 they use this, if you're looking at the actual, as I said, it, it's based on certain hours a day. So yeah. for the first three months, they have to use it for 23 hours. And after that, they use it only at nap time when they're sleeping, oh. so roughly about 10 hours. So when they're awake, after their first three months, roughly when they're age four or five, they generally don't have to use this throughout the whole day. It's only when they're sleeping. So at the age they start crawling, walking, standing, they are not on this when they are awake, lah. But they have to use it when they're asleep. I see. Okay. It's like yeah. uh, so wearing your braces the, the... when you finish wearing your braces, you need to wear the retainers, lah. Probably not, but since I'm not very fond of <laughs> dentists, I don't know. <laughs> yes, you need to wear okay. retainers after you wear braces. Yes. <laughs> okay. Go All right. On. Okay. So these are just examples of shoes. This this is a we had some samples. This is in my old hospital. So we used to have like a, you know, a display unit of the different types of shoes and all. But unfortunately, I think the one that says Dobbs shoes and bars, it disappeared somewhere. It's not there anymore. I don't know why. <laughs> Someone must have ticked it. Like. Anyway, we had that, you know, to display. Okay, so how do we check progress? So we're doing casting every week and we say, oh, it looks nicer, it looks better. But how do you know it's actually improving? Well, there's several scoring systems uh, that you can do to, to check on the progress to see how well it's, it's going. The, the one that I commonly use is this. It's called the Pirani scoring system. Nobody here has to rem uh, remember this unless you're doing pediatric auto. Uh, but for me, it's okay. It's one of the things I need to remember. So generally, there's different uh, categories to score how much, you know, how bad the deformity is. A higher score means a worse deformity. Most children come to you, there will be a score of about six. So they have one for each. And then once it's, it's better, you, you bring it down to, you know, as low as possible most of the time. Uh, another scoring system that is used is by this guy, DiMaglio. Okay, so he is, uh, Alan DiMaglio is actually a very famous French uh, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he came up with a different classification system, which I uh, met him as well, but I find it a bit con complicated and it's a little bit more iffy compared to the Pirani scoring system. Yeah, but it's also quite uh, widely accepted and widely used uh, system as well among the, you know, those who do club foot treatment anyway. Uh, this is Professor, the late Professor Sen Gupta from UM. So he came up with a very simple classification method, which we tended to use only in UM because it wasn't really, you know, verified after after a while. Uh, but it, it it gives a more logical and simple way of identifying club foot. Okay, so the other thing sorry, is this. Is Sen Gupta a Malaysian? If I remember, uh, he's originally from India. Yeah, I, I when I was in UM, he was still the head of uh, department. He was, yes. Yeah, I think when 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 I joined as a lecturer, he passed away a few months later. Oh. Not my fault. Anyway. But, but, yeah, sure, but when I was there, he was already quite old, I think. Yeah, I mean, he was a mentor of sorts, like it's a very very. Uh, He's a very soft-spoken guy, right? Yeah. yeah, a very very good teacher actually. I learned like a, a fair bit from him throughout his years there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so, so anyway, complex cases. So yeah, as I said, like it, with any sort of you know disease or deformity in orthopedics or any other thing, you're going to have cases that don't fit the picture so well. So the more complex cases, yeah. So there are a small number of them which are usually even worse than the normal club foot. I was described by this guy called Turco. Uh, he called them atypical or they call it complex club foot as well. So if you see something like this, basically, it's big trouble, lah. Yeah. You just got to tread carefully when you see a complex club foot condition. Okay, something like this. So what are the features of a complex club foot? If you're, you know, you're unfamiliar with it, you think everything looks the same. But in these cases, if you do notice the toes are actually pointing very, very high up compared to the, the sort of the basic club foot. You know, it's very, very tight. Uh, if you look behind, the calf muscles are small. They have a very tight posterior crease. One of my patients quite recently actually had a double crease at the back, you know, so it's very, very tight in equinus. Uh, it just doesn't fit the sort of the normal picture, yeah? This foot looks even more, uh, you know, grotesque and deformed. There's a very strong medial crease across the plantar surface of the foot. And if you do x-rays, you normally don't do x-rays, but if you do, you will notice that uh, all the metatarsals are shaped like, like a cave. So they're very, very dorsiflex, uh, plantar flex, sorry. And uh, it, it's very much more difficult to correct using casting. So what we do is uh, we do the same Ponsetti's method, but it's a modified method. So there are certain steps throughout the Ponsetti thing which you change as you go along. So if Wait, you use can the I ask you method, a question first? Yeah. yeah. Um, despite all this, uh, this uh, deformity, right? 
Hmm. But the bones are all normally uh, normal, right? Uh, the bones are not to say very normal. Most of the problem is the position of the bone is not so normal. Yes, but the... They tend to be there, bone, but they're not... Yeah, the they're positions correct. are not normal, but the bones, the size, the 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 yeah. structure and everything is normal, right? So in, in a nutshell, they are generally uh, normal. You in more so in some cases you may get size variations smaller than the other side maybe, you oh. know may not be the same size. But uh, in terms of them being there, yes, all the bones are where they should be, just that their positions are in a tight package. And the problem is a lot of them are very tight and rigid, so the ligaments around there, the soft tissue around there, just holds everything out of place. So the bones uh, don't behave like they normally should, actually. But if you're looking at anatomically, anatomically, yes, the bones are all there. Just okay. that there may be some variations to it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And this is in the idiopathic or the, the run-of-the-mill type of club food. If you have syndromic, neurogenic, and all that, it's slightly different sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, the again, the complex ones are, are far more severe and difficult to manage. All right. So, casting can still be done. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a modified... Uh, technique and it's usually supplemented with some sort of surgery some people do tendon transfers you can do releases of the soft tissue and the one that i commonly like is actually to use an external fixator elizorov they call it to gradually actually correct the deformity with this big metal contraption oh, you know yeah. so it's, yeah so it's not nice but it, it works really well especially for the more neurogenic and more resistant recalcitrant type of club foot uh, not commonly done, but uh, some of us still do this. Also. Okay, so this is just a few uh, research things that I was involved in. Uh, the second one, uh, you know, starting treatment for idiopathic club foot using Ponseti before or after one month of age. So we came up with this study because, a lot, as I mentioned, in Malaysia, a lot of people after birth go back confinement, go back kampung and all that. So we don't get to treat them as soon as possible. Uh, but so what we did is we, we saw that those patients that we started treatment after one month, or before one month, there was actually <clears throat> the end result was fairly uh, similar, you know. So at least up to a month, it is still safe to start the, the casting, you know, one month uh, within a, the first month of age. You don't have to start it, you know, the moment they come out of the, of the uterus, you know. So uh, originally described that it should be as soon as possible, but uh, some leeway is given that after a month, you can actually still achieve a good correction with this type of treatment. Okay, uh, hope that was clear. Uh, oh, this is another study done. Uh, as I mentioned, the last step in Ponseti's treatment is doing an Achilles tendon tenotomy, where you actually uh, release the Achilles tendon posteriorly. So this study uh, gave me a good chance to work with some good-looking people as well. Uh, <laughs> what we did is uh, we, we compared, uh, we did an ultrasound scan to compare the, the tendon, you know, uh, before and after, three weeks after tenotomy. So when you do that, you realize that once the tendon has been released, you put them on a cast, three weeks later when you do the ultrasound, the tendon has regenerated in a longer fashion. So they have more flexible movement. You know, so that was the concept of uh, doing this kind of procedure. So you get the correction with a small procedure to lengthen the tendon at the back. And you, know? you do this day as a day care? It's done basically in the clinic under just local anesthetic. Oh, but you yeah. sedate, of course, you have to sedate the child, huh? Uh, not really, lah. You just give local anesthetic. Lah. But the child. Uh, normally, we don't give sedation because they're, they're fairly young. At this stage, they're probably about six weeks old to two months at most. I see. Uh, so, you just give a bit of local anesthetic and go. There are some doctors who do this under general anesthesia. So, you put them in OT, put them to sleep, and can be done there as well. Uh, but it depends on the surgeon's preference. A lot of times, we just do it in the clinic. Uh, to save time, actually, oh. and cost. Yeah. So it's such a simple thing. Uh, it is a simple procedure, but it has to be done by someone who knows what they're doing. Because sometimes <laughs> you can cut off the wrong thing yeah, <laughs> because I'm you're sure. doing it blindly. Even doing it blindly. the <clears throat> even the the casting, right? Yes. It's so like so personalized, right? Yeah. So the casting itself. Uh, we've run a, quite a few workshops to, to even in Malaysia, we've done workshops in areas where they don't have pediatric orthopedics. So there's courses we did in Miri once and we did in JB, I think, Batu Pahad and all that. A uh, few places we've done uh, like a roadshow workshop kind of thing, just to sort of, you know, show the doctors there what the casting is about, what are the things they need to do. 
and uh, you know what are the pitfalls because we, we can't be everywhere doing it so the 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 doctors at certain hospitals if unfortunately they are from you know rural areas or what then they they the, the best they can do is you know at least know what this kind of treatment is is about basically okay. if you're lucky enough to come to a big center okay lah yeah um there are some questions. Are you and uh, have you finished or is oh, yeah, that... I think almost done. These are just uh, some quick patient pictures. Okay. Okay. Uh, nothing, no naked kids. Don't worry. Yeah, um, yeah. This, yeah. Uh, this is just uh, some of our patients we have. So this is how they present. Obviously, it looks like a club, uh, golf club to some, but it's called club food. After correction, pretty much a decent correction achieved. Yeah. So these are some of our old patients. Uh, this guy did very well. This patient, the mom took every time they came for casting, and you can notice that it's improved. And from you know May until July, position of the foot. Well, the the parents would be so happy uh, when they see the difference every. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because uh, the the worst thing is, uh, you know, some of these are even detected antenatally. You can do a detailed ultrasound oh, and they pick I up that the patient may be club foot. So the parents are freaked out even before the baby is born, and then they come to you like like you know early and all. But obviously, these are patients who have that. Uh, you know, uh, how you say they're in the, not in the rural areas or whatnot, the urban areas, so they get to check all this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So conclusion, quick one. Club food is treatable. It's a treatable congenital food deformity. Correct diagnosis. That means you need to diagnose the food deformity correctly. It has to have all the deformities together. If you have only one of it, it's not club food. Yeah. Early treatment, adequate expertise, and compliance to the treatment protocol are paramount to successful treatment, basically. Current treatment methods are proven to be effective and actually prevent long-term morbidity for the patient. Uh, more is being done for underdeveloped countries to adopt this method and even for us in, in areas where you know it's not accessible for most. But the journey is a long one. So parents have to you know understand that uh, treating club food doesn't just end with us doing the casting or it doesn't improve if you come one visit to my clinic it's not going to suddenly disappear you know it's a long journey it takes four to five years before you can actually safely say that the treatment is a success all right thank you again okay we have some question ready i got that hold on oh, eh? yeah the chat eh? on the chat yes the so chat. Doc, uh, Nuru atira asks is insurance covered for the treatment of club food oh very easy answer no no right. Yeah. Okay. Any any congenital deformity, uh, there is an issue with the insurance coverage. So um, generally no lah. Okay, and um, this <laughs> casting <laughs> right? Uh, is sorry. it the uh, the casting is not too expensive, right? Uh, not at all. Actually, uh, casting right when you do a serial casting, it's always used to. Uh, it's always good to use the traditional. Pop. POP material, not the fiberglass that we have in all these fancy hospitals. So I actually have my own supply of this cast. They don't have it in, in any private hospital. They only have fiberglass. So oh, I actually you mean there's it no up. more POP? No, no, no. They have the fiberglass one, the high fund eye one, light one. Oh, but it's not I good at correcting club food. So we use the normal sort of cast uh, for these patients. Eh? Okay, we went through the questions. Upper Pabrizan, CTV, then club food. Basically, CTEV is the it's another name for club foot. Huh? Congenital telepus equinovirus is oh. known as club foot. Uh -huh. Okay. So, yeah, Fiona, there another... is a question from Dr. Um, yes. Is there any role of X-ray for club foot? Right. So, yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Actually, uh, in the treatment of club foot, in general, no. X-rays do not uh, give you any added benefit in terms of how you're going to approach the treatment or even the outcome. Only in resistant cases, recurrent cases, or recalcitrant cases. So these are things, uh, not the baby, you know. This is like, say you have treated them, but the treatment has failed or the treatment has recurred. And then they need further correction. So you may be thinking of surgery, using the illiterate, using frames and whatnot. Then, yes, x-rays play a part. But for the normal club foot, if they come in, you know, day one of life and you find that it looks like a club foot, no point doing an x-ray. The second reason is... Uh, if anyone has actually seen x-rays in a baby, in a child, you don't see much, okay? All the bones are generally still cartilaginous, so they don't come out very well on x-ray. They don't show on x-ray. It just looks like the food is hanging there with a few small bones, so it doesn't give uh, much value to the treatment of club foot. 
it must be very difficult for you to um explain the to pa patients' parents, right? I mean, yeah. to to give them the emotional support. Yeah, and actually, I'm glad you brought that up because there are a few uh, support groups around. Mm -hmm. I mean, beyond just the doctor talking to them, um, who run certain Facebook pages as well, Club Foot, uh, Club Foot, uh, Malaysia Support Group, and all that. So there are a few people running. These are generally by parents, uh, you know, of children with club food. So they actually run this kind of uh, thing where, you know, you can each, each other advice. You can find out about the braces, the different types, and even sell to each other and whatnot because it's not cheap, these kind of, you know, shoes and braces and oh, whatnot. So it can be reused now. Huh? Yeah. Okay. The good news is I actually checked up some famous people uh, who uh -huh. had club food. And really? that an Olympic figure skater, her name is Christy Yamaguchi. She oh. was actually born with club foot. Okay. And there are some NFL players, um, Troy Eggman and Charles Woodson. Not that I know them. Mm -hmm. uh, of the, or no of oh, them. But okay. they were also born with club foot. Yeah. And um, they, I think, went for corrective surgery. So I'm not sure. Right. Yes, but um, yeah. so it is. Uh, well, if you can play the Olympics and NFL yes, or NHL, right. or, okay, so, la. so, so um, food is not a dead sentence, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's, you but... can tell the parents that. Okay. <laughs> I use famous names, la. So yeah. okay, what if the complications of club food is not corrected? Uh, yeah. So generally, okay, this is just a brief thing. In pediatric orthopedics, right, you have different types of deformities. So I always tell parents that some deformities, you have to treat it as soon as possible. And some deformities, you have to treat it at a time-specific area. Okay, so club food has to be treated as soon as possible. One of the complications that happen is the food will remain in that abnormal position. So if you see a club food, the food is pointing inwards, right? Mm -hmm. There's no way they can put their heel on the ground when they stand. So for a normal person to stand, for to, to stand normally, I mean, you need to put the heel on the ground and you need to have a uh, stable foot. So if you are standing sideways like that, Bingo, you're standing on the side of your foot and it will not self-correct or correct itself as the patient grows. You know, you will just maintain in a really bad position. You will be able to walk with a lot of pain eventually and it leads to a lot of other, uh, you know, joint problems, abnormal walking. So it's really... Uh, the, the actual club foot does not correct itself. Basically, you can't walk normally if you don't correct it. Yeah. I think it. it's, a, it's, a, it's not only, for example, development of the child and then the complication of maybe osteoarthritis eventually, but the, the self-esteem of the child, okay, is also going to be impaired because he's abnormal. Yeah. Right. So uh, right. somebody in uh, Facebook asked usually how long yeah. will the treatment be? I think you have explained. Yeah. yeah. So in on average, in a normal sort of the simpler club foods, it takes about maybe five to six casts. So five to six weeks of casting, followed by the bracing and the shoe. Yeah. That is until they are four to five years old, the bracing and shoe. But the casting part, roughly five to six weeks. In a more, maybe a maybe simpler case, you can get it within four weeks sometimes. The correction is achieved faster. In very difficult cases, even 10 times, maybe 10 weeks, 12 weeks, you're still casting until you get the position. I think yeah. it's a very important uh, take-home message for all parents with uh, babies with club fit. Is yeah. It only takes four to five weeks to treat, to get it back to, uh, you know, so yeah. don't despair. You know, yeah. it's just that the bracing may take some time, but you can Correct. see your child having a normal foot or normal feet by five weeks, you yeah. know. So that is very important also. Yeah, so it, it, it corrects. Uh, I just say if all goes well, it corrects fairly fast, but the maintenance of the correction yeah, is where the problem right. lies. So yeah. they really have to be very, very compliant with further treatment. So there's a question about can adult with untreated club foot be treated now or is it too late? Uh, it's a good question. Thank you. Actually, uh, they can be treated. Clubfoot, as you get older, the method of treatment may change. Yeah. There are some people, you know, internationally, they've presented papers where they treat even adults using the similar method of casting, basically the same Ponseti protocol. 
So it has been proven even in adults to work. But putting a cast on adults and limiting their mobility and compliance and all that a bit difficult because obviously they don't go on that brace and shoe after that. They go on a different modified kind of a footwear and all that. So if they are adults, uh, sometimes you may lean a little bit more towards surgical type of correction for them compared to just the casting. You can try with the casting, but sometimes it's a bit more challenging, a bit more difficult and less predictable than in, in, in children. So if the child doesn't come to you at birth and the child comes to you, let's say, at a, as a toddler or school-going child, you can still treat? Yes, you can still go because uh, we have children uh, who have recurrence most of the time. Okay, like if like first time presenting also, yes. Oh, I see. But so if like recurrence also we have. So we have kids who are school-going and whatnot and you still... In children, I always would try to consider casting them again. That means we use the same protocol again from day one, six weeks, try the bracing, maybe modify the shoe wear a little bit compared to what, you know, the sizes that we have. Uh, but the treatment protocol will remain very, very similar even in, in children. But we are, when, when they get a bit more difficult, when they get a bit bigger, older, more complex, then you lean a little bit more towards a bit more surgical uh, options as as well, we use some of the surgical options to supplement the casting. Okay, it's not just purely the casting. I think we missed a question by Dr. Oh, Sin Ting. Huh? Oh. Okay, what if they develop pressure sore due to casting? All right, yeah, so very common, actually, it's not say very common, but it's, it, is, it is a problem. Yeah, sometimes uh, when casts are applied, especially if you don't mold it into the correct position, or because their foot is already fairly rigid and abnormal. Pressure, pressure ulcers can happen. What I normally do is you stop the casting for a short while. Let the pressure ulcer settle. So when you remove the cast, if you see there's a pressure sore there, there's a wound there, stop the cast for a week, re restart it again one week later until the pressure sore has healed. You know? Uh, so don't continue with the pressure sore and try to put a cast on top of it and you know, turn gangrene and all sorts of funny things. So if there's a wound, if there's any complications with the casting, no harm in forfeiting one week maybe you know you say oh it must be so compliant that's why i said people have modified this sponsorship method you have to base it on each patient as they come and you know your your situation as well so if they have ulcers if they have pressure sores yes you have to stop it for a while and then continue when the ulcer is here is the french method also casting no the french method actually i'm not very familiar with but it involves a lot of physiotherapy and strapping Oh, I see. It's not casting yeah. at all. No. It's completely different. Yeah, and it's on a daily change and the parents do the stretching and all sorts of funny things. But I'm not so familiar with that method, actually. And not used as commonly as the Ponseti method is. And it's a very common uh, congenital disorder. Fairly common. 1.5 to 1,000. 1 That's to right. 1,000 like that. Yeah. yeah. So it is fairly common. Uh, again, um. We have seen a fair number in this country as well. So it's worldwide pretty much. It's not like, you know, significantly different from any other country. Any other questions I missed? Okay. Um, just um, to tell everyone that one, um, today we're only giving ESERT because somebody forgot to apply CPD points for doctors. Okay. So all can actually uh, register for the ESERT. Uh, two is that... Um, Please join the Telegram group because I'm not going to send the ESET individually anymore. It's too much work. Now from 100 to 300, now 1,000 of people register for the ESET. I, just, I can't do it. So join the Telegram group. I will send the link and you can retrieve from there. Okay. And then I think we are done. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope that uh, this really create awareness among the public because I've also live streamed it to the public uh, on my Facebook. And um, I think that uh, everybody should know that it's a very treatable condition, uh, even though a, a lot of it depends on the parents' resilience. True, yeah. Yes, um, but you can see a difference. It means the child can have a normal foot or fit by five weeks, that's incredible. So anything, please contact Dr. Roshan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No. Uh, yeah. uh, he's in SGMC. And um, I think I'll stop recording here. And then right. see Thank you, you next week. Next week, we have another webinar. And these days, again, we have a new method of registering, which is through the website. 
so that I don't have to send any more e uh, e email also for the Zoom link because it's too much work. So, uh, okay. Thank you very much, Roshan. Sure, thank you so much. You, uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah. So maybe the next time we can have another webinar again. Sure, sure. No problem. My pleasure. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. See you then. Bye-bye.